Okay, everybody, settle down. Settle down, all right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, we're really pleased to have uh, Brigitte Whaley give the next talk. She's a professor at UC Berkeley in the chemistry department, and she's also the director of the Berkeley Quantum Information and Computation Center. And more important from our point of view is that she's the organizer of this teacher's conference, and she it's really her vision and uh, her ideas which made this possible uh, I would say, and uh, she, yeah, let's thank her. Th this kind of conference doesn't come together by itself, and she had such good taste in choosing the speakers and uh, convincing them that this was a, a great thing to do, and I think, uh, I think it's really turned out. It's the best teacher's conference I've ever been to, I have to say. It's your first. It is my first, first. too, but okay. <laughs> okay. All right. So without further ado, uh, we're going to hear about a very exciting area of quantum information uh, and uh, quantum mechanics, I would say, which is applications to biology. Okay. Thank you, Greg. And thank you all for coming. It's been uh, really nice to meet you all and to um, participate in uh, this really fun uh, event. And I've also learned quite a lot from all the other talks as well, so it's not just you that are learning. So what I'm going to talk about in this, um, in the next 40, 50 minutes is uh, some analysis that has been going on in the community, or this community of quantum uh, uh, physics, quantum control, quantum coherence, uh, of where these uh, phenomena might occur in biology. And in particular, I will tell you about uh, what happens in these muddy ponds in Yellowstone a little bit, and a little bit I'll summarize um, how birds might be singing a quantum mechanical song. And um, so let me start with this slide, which is um, borrow a lot of my slides are borrowed from other people. This one's from Ashi Ali Pasha Vaziri, who's a quantum optician experimentalist now working in um, uh, in a biophysical institute at the University of Vienna. And this slice, uh, slide nicely illustrates what uh, a lot of us in, who are interested in biology are doing with tools of quantum physics. Basically, we have these tools, which I'll say a little bit about, which are getting ever allowing us to probe biological systems on ever smaller uh, length scales, you know, going down from the brain to the mess of um, neurons to individual axons. Now we have synapses and then uh, molecular, quasi-molecular structures where we've got a few molecules embedded in proteins. Now we have molecules and now we have atoms at the bottom. Uh, so the tools are really allowing us to probe all the way down here in biology now. And at the same time, uh, we know uh, from quantum physics that as we are approaching the molecular scale, things are behaving quantum mechanically. And you've heard lots of nice examples of that. Uh, today, of atoms and molecules. And so we know that somewhere also has been mentioned today that somewhere on this length, sort of scale of decreasing length, there's a quantum classical boundary. You know, we don't normally think about the brain uh, behaving quantum mechanically, at least most people don't. Um, there's some exceptions. Um, and we don't quite know where this boundary is, certainly not in terms of biological systems. We don't even know where it is in the inanimate systems that we've heard about so far today. Uh, but most importantly, from the bio biological point of view, so you could imagine these are the physicists coming down with the tools here, biology, uh, but we need to go back up and answer critical questions for biology, which is, what does all this uh, analysis of biology at these very small length scales, what does it mean for the function? Is it important at all? Um, and in particular, the question that we're interested in is, can quantum coherence be relevant for biological function? Okay. So now let me say a little bit. So I'm going to first of all give a few slides of history and overview of what uh, people are interested are studying within the whole so-called sub-discipline of quantum biology. And uh, people think it might, it's a new field, but actually it has very long roots. 
so Bohr, when he finished cleaning up quantum mechanics in 1929, he basically spent the rest of his life looking at biology. He was looking for a complementarity principle uh, that would apply to life, so he didn't find that. Um, the term quantum biology though, was, was uh, coined around that time by Paul Jordan, one of his collaborators who was also interested in these complementarity issues. But the first person who really uh, did real quantum biology as we understand it today was another quantum physicist from Bohr's group, Max Del Brook, who t very importantly teamed together, instead of talking uh, just with other physicists, he actually went into the trenches and teamed up with two biologists, well, this one was probably a physical chemist, photobiologist, and Timofey Vrasovsky was a real biologist, a geneticist, and they used x-rays to probe the structure of what at that point was called the genetic material, because they didn't know what the molecular structure was, and they made very extensive studies of mutations. And this is really the first quantum probe of biological structures and tying that probe to function, looking at the mutations. And it was an implicit acknowledgement of the need to understand the detailed molecular structure of functional biological entities. Now, we do, of course, we don't always in biology need to understand detailed molecular structure, but in terms of the quantum effects, that's really where, where we're at. And so I tend to divide um, quantum biology into a, like a BC and a AD, a BL before the laser and an AL after the laser, where very different things have been studied. So the first era, which really, I think, would, one could say culminated with the structural um, solution of DNA in 1953, uh, was basically concerned with understanding the nature of molecular structure. We know that mole molecules have en uh, quantized energy levels. We also know, as was mentioned earlier today, the, the pathways between different conformations or different, uh, different molecules, different reactivities go via transition states, and the, the energy barriers which determine these transformations are also given by quantum mechanical principles and can be calculated or extracted from experiments. So it was really, um, in the first era, it was using uh, the quantum nature of molecular energy levels and energy barriers to, to analyze the stability of biological material, to analyze kinetics, of transformations and uh, energetics. And this, a lot of this was, was summarized in Schrodinger's little book from 1943, which basically is a pretty concise summary of Max Del Brook's work um, in the 30s and early 40s. Now, what we're interested in today is more the quantum dynamical effects, which weren't accessible at that time experimentally, and so people really didn't think about them too much. But since the laser, we have new generations of dynamical probes, and today, since the advent of quantum uh, information processing and the intersection of that with quantum physics and all this new push for uh, innovative quantum science and technology, we have even more um, dynamical probes beyond the laser, and I'll mention a few of those in the talk. So this is a very futuristic dream from Berkeley of light harvesting here, this is a light harvesting complex I'll talk about a lot. This is the bay, a bit choppy out there. This is uh, evidence of coherence that I'll show you. And here's the sun coming in. And this, of course, this is a, a, a source of hard x-rays somewhere in the future that might be located to be used to probe really on a super, super duper uh, atomic, time scale, uh, atomic length scale and time scale. So that's basically still in the future. So this is uh, just to show you how really experiment has driven this interest in quantum dynamical effects in biology. So starting in 1963, the primary step of vision, which I'll, if I have time at the end, if I don't have time, ask me the questions. I've got a slide on that. Uh, the, the primary step of vision is a photoisomerization which has femtosecond dynamics and proceeds via combined electron nuclear dynamics, and it's actually been studied very nicely by, with quantum control by Dwayne Miller here. So I'll show you that at the end of this time. But then these other uh, things here, so tunneling, even though tunneling, even both electron tunneling and hydrogen tunneling were actually uh, developed, I mean, these notions that are very well understood in the 1920s. Hydro uh, Bell wrote a book on hydrogen tunneling in 1933. 
but uh, there was no evidence for this. So Schrodinger never mentioned any uh, tunneling phenomena in his book. He also didn't mention any phenomena of coherence. In fact, he adamantly spoke out against this. Uh, and the reason he didn't um, mention it is because there wasn't any evidence. But in the starting in the late 70s, uh, and in particular over the last 10 years, five years, I suppose, there's been uh, experimental evidence that there is indeed some coherence in the, in, in the electronic excitation of molecules during the light harvesting step of photosynthesis. So I'll explain all that um, uh, in, the next, in the first half of the talk. Then there are these additional, so these are things where there's really hard experimental data, even though the interpretation isn't entirely, in all cases, unambiguous. Down here, I've listed additional pro proposals which are, for which there is no hard experimental data. But this one right here about uh, bird navigation, um, there's a lot of experiments that are consistent with this. And I thought I would, in the second half of the talk, give a little summary of this. So you see that uh, where you see that the birds may be solving the Schrodinger equation as they sing. OK, so Schrodinger, yes. So Schrodinger actually, in his book, he, uh, so he has no consideration of tunneling or quantum coherence or entanglement, even though he is the father of the term entanglement. And that was in his paper from 1935. In 1943, he says, quantum indeterminacy, such as we, um, as, Gra as Gerard summarized uh, in the first talk today, Schrodinger said explicitly, quantum indeterminacy plays no biologically relevant role in bodily events. Correspond he, he confined himself to the mind, which he was very interested in, uh, except possibly by enhancing accidental nature of meiosis, mutations, etc. Okay. So what, we're, what I'm going to show you in the, uh, in the next um, part of the talk is not uh, quantum indeterminacy in the mind. In fact, I'm going to avoid the mind. Uh, it's going to be strictly plants and bacteria, light harvesting. And this is then the last, before I do that, this is just one last summary slide for the overview of the, the, the topics, or the, the, the phenomena that people are studying. So the biological phenomena are basically photosynthesis, huge amount of effort on that. Vision, I've already mentioned. Enzyme catalysis and uh, bird navigation. And then the quantum processes involved are summarized here on the bottom. So energy transfer is the one I'll talk about in photosynthesis. There's also electron transfer that happens subsequent to the energy transfer. And then here one has in the, um, for the enzyme catalysis, that's where hydrogen atom transfer and quantum effects there are important, as well as electron transfer. And the bird navigation involves these pairs of electrons, which are kind of nice, uh, because in print, they are, in principle, entangled pairs. And the, the entanglement um, does play a role in the, in the putative theory. OK, so now let me focus on photosynthesis for the next uh, probably 15 minutes, 20 minutes. And so this is a schematic of uh, what photosynthesis is. Uh, plants, green plants, or bacteria, bacteria living in ponds, as in Yellowstone, or these, some of these bacteria can survive at very extreme conditions in vents several kilometers below the ocean. In fact, this is actually one from Wikipedia page, which is two kilometers below the ocean. But there's most recently, just maybe a month ago or two months ago, there are reports of vents which go eight kilometers down. And they've also, also found living organisms and uh, bacterial, uh, photosynthetically active bacteria down there. So, so they're using black body radiation from the vents, presumably. OK. so. Up on the top here, you have this uh, overview of photosynthesis, which so light is absorbed. And the light gets transmitted from the surface of the leaf through some antenna, which is so-called light harvesting antenna. And it gets to a place where the energy, so this is all in, electronic, in the form of electronic energy, electronic excitation of a molecule. Here, the electronic energy uh, initiates a charge separation. And after you have a charge separation, you have an electron and a hole. And then you have real chemistry happening, electron transfer reactions, water splitting, and proton transport. And so this is where then sugars are produced and all these good things. Um, 
which uh, give us energy or give the plant energy and uh, create st store energy for, for us. So what we're interested in, in in this issue of quantum dynamics right now, I mean, there are people who are interested. There are experiments and work going on on, on the effects of quantum dynamics here. But what I'm going to tell you about today is something which is relatively simple, uh, which, which is just a step of energy transfer through this antenna. And I'll show you the structure of these things in a moment. To, uh, to of the energy, uh, electronic energy. So it's basically this process which happens really just at the top of this green box. There's no real reaction in what I'm going to be telling you. It's just a transfer of energy from one molecule to another. Now the uh, remarkable thing about this transfer of energy is that it's incredibly co uh, efficient. So per photon absorbed, one always gets close to one electron hole pair separation. So one photon in generates effectively one electron hole pair. So that's what's been, uh, meant by the quantum efficiency. The energetic efficiency is a lot less because there's a large energy drop here and there's a lot of energy given out into the, um, the proteins in the plant and also beyond the charge separation, there's another drop in energy. So energetically, photosynthesis is uh, shown to be maximum about 13%. In practice, it's about 2% in plants. But the quantum efficiency is what we're interested in here. And that's very, very high. OK, so the general picture is shown schematically here. So it has light coming in here. We think about it as individual photons, but you can also think about it as continuous uh, illumination by uh, classical light. And the general picture is that there's this antenna and it has some structure uh, which is very complicated. I'll show you examples of molecules which can absorb light. So these are uh, typically chlorophyll molecules. Probably the biologists in the audience know this better than I do. So the chlorophyll molecules have these conjugated rings and they are very effective at absorbing uh, visible light. And then once a molecule is absorbed, um, one photon, it's in an electronically excited state. And then it transfers that energy with the next molecule. So the next molecule goes up in energy, this one goes down, and then the next one goes up and this one goes down. And so it then travels through. And until recently, the picture of this process of energy transfer going through, it has to spatially go through the antenna system to get to the, the location where uh, electron hole separation and then real chemical reactions can happen, was that there were, this was a hopping process that one could imagine this just like a diffusive random walk, uh, and eventually the excitation would find its way to the electron, to the reaction center. Uh, and this happens at very low in light intensity. And again, the only, the odd thing about this was, it's a diffu the, the picture was that it's a diffusive hopping transfer, but it has this very high quantum yield, which always made people think, well, maybe there's more to this than just hopping around. Um, diffusively. Now, let me, so let me show you what they look like, these things. And as a physicist, as a quantum physicist, it's actually truly a little bit bewildering, both in the variety, there's very many different types, and then more importantly, the fact that most of them, now this one is a, the exception. This one looks like it has some symmetry. So if you're a theoretical physicist, you think, ah, this is a good one, let's look at this. Uh, <laughs> we might be able to do something here. Um, but this is really, truly the exception. The most important one for us is probably, uh, since 50% of green matter on Earth uses this, this is called Photosystem II uh, of higher plants, so advanced plants. And this has a total of about um, 320 uh, pig what we call pigments, pigments or chromophores, same word, means the same thing. These are molecules that absorb visible light. And there are about, as I say, 320 of these embedded, and they're grouped in this uh, complex. So this complex is what we call a super complex. And it's divided into smaller individual complexes, which have very, which, so this one here, these are the peripheral complexes, the so-called antenna complexes, LHC2, as I've shown over here. I'll come to the detail in a moment. And then in the interior here is what's called the core complex. And right in here somewhere is the reaction center, I think it's I think it's somewhere down here. It may be behind these things. 
So the energy in, the, in green plants, the energy uh, the photon is incident from the sun on these peripheral species here, these LHC2s. And in here, you see the blue things are the, represent the chlorophyll molecules. And the, the spirals, actually, there, there's two types of chlorophyll molecules here. So there's one type, which are denoted by blue. There's another type denoted by green. And then the gray spirals indicate a protein framework in which these molecules are embedded. So it's like you have a nice, well-defined organic molecule, and it's embedded in some protein scaffold. And the protein scaffold holds it in very rigidly in place. There are small exceptions, and these are very important. But generally speaking, we know the relative orientations of all these molecules. We know their structures. and. Uh, in, in some cases, I think in this case also there's, a, there's an X-ray crystallography structure of this. Okay, so now this is the general situation is that the, the, these antenna systems are just like this. So they have molecules embedded in protein scaffolds. Now that's where if you're a quantum physicist you might give up and go away because that's far too complicated. Uh, but as always, the exception proves the rule, there is they are often, but not always, embedded in protein scaffolds. And there's one very interesting one, which is this uh, antenna system of this green sulfur bacteria that can live below the ocean in these vents, which has an enormous uh, antenna system, which is called a chlorosome, which doesn't have any protein. And this, this is a TEM of, uh, actually, so this, this is very hard to study this in the wild. So this is, they made a mutant and then managed to do TEM of this and also some X-ray structures. And this is the, uh, what people think the structure of this is now. You have these uh, stacks of chlorophylls, which are shown here, the, 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 just the heads of the chlorophylls. So these flat molecules here would be the heads. So they're basically um, planar, like porphyrins. And these are stacks are self-assembled into concentric tubes, like nanotubes, and so you have a helical arrangement of the transition moments of the molecules, and that uh, means that you have a helical, I mean, these are details you probably don't want to think about, but basically they have this interesting helical structure. Now, but the real thing I wanted to show you with this slide is that this complex here has no protein. It's all just chlorophylls. So that would also make it a nice system to study. But there's about, in any one of these complexes here, there's about 250,000 chlorophyll molecules. And they're very fragile, they're very hard to study experimentally. So theoretically, uh, they're out there. We have our eyes on them. Some people are starting to look at them a bit. But now, that what I'm going to show you is now is what most people are studying, both theoretically and experimentally, is something much, much smaller, much simpler. And that is this little complex which sits in this green uh, sulfur bacteria um, antenna system. It sits actually just halfway between one of these big antennas, which I showed you, with the hundreds of thousands of cl uh, chlorophylls and no protein. This little guy sits in between uh, the base plate of this antenna complex out there. So it's part of what we'd call the peripheral antenna system between that and the reaction center. So this is like a, a wire, a biological wire. We think of it as a quantum wire. These are its quantum features I'll show you, which connects the antenna to the reaction center. So this guy doesn't actually receive uh, light from the sun directly or from the black bodies. It, what it receives is an excitation coming from, say, the last chlorophyll molecule in one of these structures here. So this basically, so here you have a molecule in an excited state, and then the first molecule up here, these are the heads of these chlorophylls again, tails aren't shown. That They have, each have tails that, re, that sort of anchor them inside this protein structure. So the first one here goes up, when that one goes down, and then you have the excitation here in this little wire. And this complex says there's a threefold redundancy here, and one could talk about that, but it's not in, in important for the quantum behavior. So this is nice because this this actually was the first antenna system who, uh, whose X-ray structure was solved in 1977. And secondly, it only has seven pigments. So now, now we might be able to do something, certainly in terms of understanding it. It also has a very um, a relatively large protein cage. But if we know the structure, we know where everything is. 
And so we could start to think about trying to understand some dynamical um, experiments on this. So the first thing you might want to think about is if you're thinking about energy, electronic energy transfer through this system is, well, so how do these chlorophyll molecules talk to each other? So I've told you that the excitation hops or jumps in some way from one molecule to the other, to the next one, and presumably it will be uh, most e efficient for things which are close to each other. Um, and what is the resulting, so in light of the discussion this morning, what are the resulting quantum states of the system? Well, let me just take a, um, a diversion. This is a, a, a representation of quantum superpositions which might be useful uh, for you. It's sort of the psychological, the psychologist's view of a quantum superposition. It's a visual representation with the so-called ambiguous cube. So this is a mesh representation of a cube, and if you look at it, some people will see uh, this surface on the top sticking out of them, other people will see this surface on the bottom sticking out of them. Because one hasn't indicated what's at the front and what's at the back, it's ambiguous. So some people will mentally form this image of the cube, and some people might form this image of the cube. Now, superposition would be these, both of these happening at the same time. So well, when one solves, when one takes these, this system here, and looks at what the, the quantum states are just for the molecules, one finds this kind of picture where the, each excitation is not localized on a single molecule, but the excitation is delocalized over two molecules. And that delocalization means that we have a quantum superposition just as in this ambiguous cube. So you can think of, say, this one here, one, two. The excitation is sometimes on two or appears it's one excitation, but the viewer might view it in sometimes as being on two or sometimes as being on one. So basically, the viewer will be made, you actually, when you're looking at this picture, you're making an implicitly a, a measurement in your brain that, that you're thinking of it like looking like this or looking like this. And there are also those nice ink block pictures, right, where you can turn them upside down. You could also use those. All right, so this is important to see. The, the, these, uh, these molecules are so strongly coupled that an electronic uh, excitation is not centered on a molecule, but it's actually delocalized. And this delocalization gives rise to the quantum coherence that's seen in the, in the experiments. And so let me just say, it's important for understanding this is that the energy is coming from this side, and this guy here is the one that's linked to the reaction center. So what we're always interested in is looking, and a lot of all this effort has gone into studying the energy transfer through this very, very small system. And it's been studied with what's called a two-dimensional spectroscopy, which is where you send in three laser pulses, and then you look for the signal coming out after a time delay there. Later, then you Fourier transform to get a correlation plot between the frequency at which you excite, which is the, uh, the Fourier transform uh, conjugate variable up to this time delay here, and the emission frequency here, which is the conjugate Fourier transform variable to this time delay here. So you do this, you get uh, then a correlation between what energy is going in and what energy is going out as at one particular value of this time, capital T. And if you then vary the time capital T and look at what's happening on the diagonal, on just a diagonal, in fact, on any line through this, so this is a diagonal cut shown here. So you notice, uh, so then you, and then you vary that time capital T in the middle, you see that you have oscillations in this diagonal, in the main structure on the diagonal cut. You've also got this small feature down here which has some oscillations in it. And these oscillations reflect what's happening during this time capital T, because that's what you're varying along this axis here. Now, the way this spectroscopy works is that during that time capital T, you've put, by the virtue of the sequence of pulses you have here, you've put everything into the excited electronic state. You don't have anything left in, in the, well, you have a, the, the dynamics is occurring only in the electronically excited state. So what you're seeing here are quantum beats in the electronic excited state uh, populations. And if you look off diagonal, you see 
additional quantum beads, which are evidence for quantum coherences between these excited electronic states. So this is, this is the evidence, the main evidence for quantum coherence in uh, dynamics of energy transport in, in photosynthesis today. And it was first detected by uh, Graham Fleming, my colleague in Berkeley, and there's many, many studies done since then. So the main point for understanding is that this, if you have these quantum beats, that really rules out this picture of diffusive hopping of energy through the system. So, okay, so how to understand this? So, um, well, you might first of all want to do a calculation. Uh, there you hit a bit of a roadblock because there are multiple similar energy scales. We don't have, if it was just this, that we have these two chlorophylls and there's some ex, uh, exchange of energy between them, that, that, that would be fine. But we actually have four different processes going on. We have the electronic energy transfer. We have the coupling of the electronic degrees of freedom to the protein vibrations. And you heard this morning from Dwayne Miller how complicated that is in these large biological uh, molecules. You also have relaxation of the protein vibrations, redistribution of the energy that goes into the proteins within, those, uh, within that environment. And lastly, but not least, you have energetic disorder in the pigment chromophore energies. I said they're, fairly, they're rigidly attached, but they're not completely. And the most remarkable thing is that these energy scales are actually all pretty much the same. There's no order of magnitude difference between any of them. And recent uh, so theoretical work has shown that this really doesn't seem to be an accident. That if you uh, take this little system here and you estimate, uh, you vary all these energy scales, you find that the actual experimental system appears, uh, the natural system appears to be optimized with respect to all parameters. So there seems to be some Goldilocks principle of optimization in biological systems, which is also in itself a very interesting thing to pursue. So then coming back to the relevance to uh, the quantum information, the quantum technologies community. So the first thing that was suggested when this experiment came out was that plants are performing quantum computation because the coherence is helping the excitation move spatially from one place to another, and it seems to be doing so in a very efficient way. And that's exactly what a quantum search algorithm would do, which is one of the other big application of quantum, uh, quantum computation. Well, so, so the, it was pr proposed that this FMO is performing a quantum search. And uh, well, that's not true. I won't, don't need to tell you how that works. But it's not very hard to show that that doesn't um, happen. Uh, what is, though, interesting is that the coherence is accompanied by long-lived entanglement. And let's see, I don't, yeah. So I won't go into that. But I'll, uh, I can answer questions about that later. And, um, We'll, we'll look again at the entanglement with the radical pairs of the birds. But it basically, what's happening is the one excitation, the first excitation are of the molecule, of the first molecule when you, the energy enters this wire, is more or less immediately causing an excitation, according to trans, there's, there's immediately some kind of level of transfer to the molecule which is right next to the reaction center. So, and that, it's that transfer of excitation which gives rise to the entanglement or the non-local quantum correlations between the excitation being here and the excitation being on a molecule which is about three nanometers away. So these molecules are not at all directly uh, uh, interacting. Um, so for, for a biological system, three nanometers is, so the molecular biology, this is a quite a large distance. So we don't yet understand whether this entanglement really has a role per se. Uh, what we do understand is that from a number of studies that uh, coherence, this coherence is contributing to the quantum efficiency. So you can uh, pull apart a calculation of quantum efficiency and you can sort of separate out by different measures what part of it is quantum and it, it comes out to somewhere between 1 and 10 percent. And 1 and 10 percent may not be large for a plant, but for a bacteria which reproduces rapidly, a 1 percent advantage is a huge evolutionary bonus. Uh, it allows the, um, the organism really to replicate and kill the competition. And the last thing is uh, the coherence. So this is a possible uh, advantage, an additional advantage, that this is very important for this FMO system. You have to make sure the energy goes down in one direction, doesn't go back out. 
So unidirectionality of the energy transport is very important. And the coherence uh, does enhance this unidirectionality. It also allows propagation between complexes. And furthermore, it also allows energy to be ratcheted up energy gradients. And that's, uh, OK, so that was, this, there's no, that was, OK, that, I don't know why I have that here. So that's no, no, the answer to that is no. So let me just say a few words about this. So, so this is the last uh, thing on that previous list. The question that we raised was, is quantum coherence relevant to truly long-range energy transport? So all the experiments to date have actually been performed in a single complex, either that FMO or inside. They've also done experiments on these, one of these LHC2 units inside PS2. But especially for PS2, we'd like to know, we know that the energy has to go from these peripheral complexes all the way down here. And we'd like to know, well, is this coherence transmitted between the complexes? And then, of course, the biologists always ask, well, why would it be transferred? How might it help the photosynthetic function? So a theory analysis, and i just give you a very brief description in words on the next slide. The theory shows that coherence is, it can indeed be transmitted from one complex to another. Uh, we haven't yet done on this big system, but it can be on a smaller system. The theory, furthermore, shows that it enables the, direct, the transport to go in one direction. So you can imagine here, you, you certainly don't want to be rolling, having your excitation rolling around in here and you know, finally dying out and never even getting to the reaction center. And furthermore, the uh, energy, the quantum coherence enables uphill transport. And uphill transport is, in, uh, is, it's better not to have it, but it's unavoidable because typically in biological systems, there are many competing factors which determine a particular structure. So for instance, in the FMO system I showed you before, when you go from, I think, site one to site two, there's actually an uphill step in energy, which you could uh, just represent it here. As, so this is chlorophyll one, the red one, chlorophyll two would be the blue one. If that's where these two molecules in FMO, they would be separated by about 300 wave numbers. And there are reasons why that energy uphill step might be there. For instance, for packing, uh, if, one have, if nature wants to pack as many chromophores as possible into a small volume, then it's, it's generally impossible to ensure that everything goes downhill. So what we showed was that if we take uh, all the relevant parameters and from, these, um, uh, from the FMO system in particular, we could make a little, uh, this is a toy model, which is a proof of principle of long range transport. It's basically saying we have an infinite chain of little dimers, chlorophylls one and chlorophylls uh, two, from the FMO, and they're arranged in this way such that if you go from right to left, you always have to go uphill and then down again, uphill and then down again. Now, if this were a classical random walk, you know, on a line, it's a drunken sailor analogy, right? You should you start at one point, you should be going symmetrically. The drunken sailor is going to either end up one end of the town or the other end of the town with equal probability by the morning, or maybe flat on the ground somewhere, but equal probability in both directions. So in this case, we find asymptotically that we get an uphill bias in a one-dimensional random walk. In other, the uphill bias means in this direction, where locally we have to go uphill. And we can analyze this and show that the uphill bias results precisely from non-equilibrium initial conditions after each time you go from one dimer to the next dimer. Non-equilibrium initial conditions result uh, precisely from the quantum dynamics between, these, between a pair of dimers. The non-equilibrium initial conditions give us unbalanced left and right transfer rates at short time. So, and that gives rise to this asymmetry, which is essentially a, a quantum coherent ratcheting of energy transfer. This is kind of interesting. If nature's really doing something like this in some systems, um, it's a thermal ratchet. It's not a ratchet that's being driven uh, by a periodic driving force. So it'd be a true biological ratchet. So now we're making an analysis of uh, trying to apply this the approach to analyze what's happening in this PS2. So here's the reaction center. And so one of Graham Fleming's students has sort of identified all the strongly coupled systems, and they're inside uh, all the chromophores which are strongly coupled are in these black circles. And then there are weak couplings between different units. And the question is, you know, can we analyze this to see whether coherence is really being transmitted in uh, from the peripheral complexes to the reaction center in green plants. 
And I think this will take several years to complete, but it's a very interesting result, uh, interesting project. OK, so looking forward, uh, what, what are people doing? Let me say a few words about uh, uh, things going on. Uh, so moving forward, people really are trying to get to single complex spectroscopy. So this energetic disorder that I mentioned really has a negative, uh, it really complicates analysis of the spectroscopy. So there's a lot of effort to build the analog of uh, what was recently done for uh, NMR to be able to look at a single, um, single spin. In this case, this was a single biological entity, but now we've, uh, and so we'd like to do exactly the same thing for this. And then another thing that this has, a whole area that this has, uh, um, making uh, artificial or biomimetic light harvesting systems. And this is just one particular example that's going on at Berkeley, where we're collaborating with a synthetic chemist, Matt Francis, who can take a tobacco, tobacco mosaic virus gray, blue um, structure behind here. Normally, there would be, uh, in this helical vacancy tube going up here, there would normally be the, the virus. The virus is not there. Uh, but he, instead, he can put at specific locations using genetic markers, he can put different chromophores. So he can put molecules at specific at locations differing from, say, three angstrom separation to uh, 15, 20 angstrom separation. And so the idea is to, to basically make a theoretical analysis and then design something, assess the light harvesting functionality, feedback, and optimize to make something which is a truly quantum enhanced biomimetic device. So that's light harvesting. What I've shown you is that we have um, quantum coherence observations in vitro, not on a live uh, plant yet. Theory predicts entanglement. We have some ideas about what advantage this gives us, improved efficiency and the long range energy transfer. And there's a lot of work going on with adding coherent control and, uh, and making biomimetic systems. So in the last 10 minutes, let me say something about the birds. So, okay, so on the left is a European robin, which has been uh, the most extensively studied uh, bird for this problem. On the right is shown the, uh, the Earth with the um, magnetic flux lines going out on the left, and on the right is showing the inclination at each point on the uh, surface of the Earth, the inclination of the Earth's magnetic field, which varies as we go around from south to north pole. So the, the birds appear to um, have the ability to fly uh, in specific directions, which they learn uh, in their youth, or well, it's not known whether it's learned or pre-programmed. But they can do this over thousands of miles. And one of the theories, one of the ideas about how they do this would, is by having a sense of the magnetic, being able to sense the magnetic field. In particular, being able to sense the inclination of the magnetic uh, field at the, at the surface. And so this shows uh, the, the one theory about how this might happen, which is that in the retina of the bird's eye, there are some molecules indicated here just with magnified red lines, which are rigidly attached to the uh, surface of the retina. And then by a theory, I'll show you just qualitatively without equations what, what goes into this. The theory says that the birds are able to, um, to detect the angles which these uh, molecules make with respect to the Earth's magnetic field, such by, by making, basically making a map in their eye of the integrating over all possible molecules. So they get a, a map, uh, which is then projected here into a plane. And so you see what's summarized here on the right is the way the visual map that the brain of the bird would see if it's uh, fly, if it's pointing, if its head is pointing 180 degrees respect to the Earth's magnetic field, that would be this one. Zero degrees, that's this one. Notice zero and 180 are the same. Uh, 150 degrees or 120 degrees. Here is this one where the 90 degrees. Yeah, 90 degrees, this one's perfectly out of, um, no, perpendicular to the Earth's magnetic field. And then 60 and 30. So this equivalence between zero and 180 means it's an inclination compass. 
right? and it can also detect the magnitude bit. Okay, so the, the, the current thinking is that, okay, so here's the eye, here's the retina that's turned around here, that somewhere in the rods or the cones, could be in the rods but, or it could be in the cones, there are places where there are these protein pigment, the same kind of pigment protein complexes as in light harvesting, which are rigidly located on some, um, either some membrane or between two membranes in the bird's brain. There's no, uh, the, the biology yet hasn't yet been done, so these are uh, speculations, but this is the idea. And this cryptochrome is a complex which is known to exist in the bird's brain. It's a, so it's a candidate receptor system. This internally binds some additional molecules. And this one here called FAD, uh, flavonine adenine nucle dinucleotide, does the absorption of light so this absorbs visible light. And then there's some electron transfer via these tryptophan type of molecules. This electron transfer generates a radical pair. Now what is a radical pair? A radical pair is, uh, is what we re way we refer to a complex in which we have two electrons, which may be paired or unpaired, but these two electrons, like in John Martinez's up and down spins, these two electrons are, however, they're not located together in one orbital as in an atom, or in, they're not in one same molecular orbital as it would be in a molecule. So normally we don't, we don't indicate the pairing of electrons in molecular orbitals, but in a radical pair we have two electrons in different locations, spatial locations on a molecule, and in particular in this system we have two electrons which are located on different molecules. One electron is located on this molecule here, and another, the other electron is located uh, possibly on one of these tryptophans, possibly on some other molecule. One of the real problems with this uh, mechanism is that there's no good candidate for the other partner in the radical pair. Okay, but so most, most people assume it's one of these tryptophans. But so basically one has then, okay, so here, supposing it's uh, this, the last tryptophan here, um, so this is a process of excitation, and then this guy actually takes on a hydrogen at a proton, and then an electron moves through this chain of tryptophans to the FAD, and that way you have one unpaired electron here and one unpaired electron over here. That's a distance of about 15 angstroms. So this radical pair would constitute a, uh, a two-electron um, pair of entangled spins, there are four possible quantum states of those spins. I'm not quite sure how John's, can you do twins for these different triplet states? We, I'm not sure whether we can do the twins for that. But, so I just want to mention there are, that there is more than one possible spin state for this. And again, this is just, uh, from this book. You might find useful a nice uh, visual annihilation of uh, analog of entanglement which is if one has these mesh boxes again, that when you look at these boxes, so if you've been looking at the previous one I showed you and you were looking at, you were interpreting it in terms of the, the, the hard, the dark surface at the top, then you would see both dark, your mind would project both of these boxes to have dark surfaces at the top. If you were thinking, looking at this and you saw at first, you made the measurement in your brain to see the dark surface at the bottom, you'll project also the second one to have the dark surface at the bottom. So this is basically just, again, the psychologist's view of the correlations we see, we impose by looking at these boxes. Okay, so the radical pair mechanism, what does it, what does it mean? So, so the, 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 the hypothesis is the following, that we have this uh, pair of molecules, A and B, in this case separated by 15 angstroms, and we have two electrons on them, and those two electrons could be in uh, one of these uh, in the singlet state, or the S state, which is one of these four states, or the other three states come together, they're called a triplet state, there are three of them, and so that's the po other possible. The radical pair says that these uh, pairs which are in states S or states T coherently interconvert in the presence of local magnetic fields, and the local magnetic fields derive from the interactions of the electron spins with the nuclear spins. So if you've done, ever had an MRI done on you, you know that nuclear spins are very important uh, for uh, in particular hydrogen spins, and they're in all biological material. 
So certainly there are a lot of nuclear spins in cryptochrome. And in particular in the FAD, there's a big, big nuclear spin right next to the electron, which with, there's a nitrogen, which has a big nuclear spin. So then the second aspect of the mechanism is that there are chemically distinct product yields, which are, convert, uh, which are controlled by rates, K sub S and K sub T. And these can be the same or they can be different. But they're different. The point is that these are different products. One of these products goes on to signal to the brain that, um, that the magnetic field is such and such an orientation, and the other one just goes back and recycles around. I think this is the signaling one. Then the third important feature is that this interconversion rate, so this, intercon this coherent interconversion of these entangled spin states, is also, uh, I shouldn't say determined, is controlled by a weak magnetic field. And the numbers come out, this is really a remarkable phenomenon if it's true, because the, the magnitude of these uh, interactions here between the electron spins and the magnetic nuclei are about, um, about 1,000 microtesla. And that means that the, and the, weak, and the Earth's magnetic field is still smaller than that. Most magnetic field is about 50 microtesla. But this 50 microtesla magnetic field can modify this uh, interconversion rate. And it does it enough to give, um, for an, if these interactions here are anisotropic, it will give sensitivity, enough sufficient sensitivity to the inclination of B for the bird to find its way. So this is basically the radical pair mechanism in a nutshell, without an equation. So then this is just a picture showing these guys. So here's, oh, here you see. So this represents the, um, here's the electron spin, uh, which is represented by a vector here. And here's a nitrogen and hydrogen. So you see there's going to be an appreciable uh, interaction between the nuclear spins of these uh, atoms with the electron spin. Over here, there's also at least one hydrogen, so there'll be another one there. Okay. So, but then this is the, the, what I want you to take home with you. This is uh, the picture, which is that after this, uh, so if this is all happening and going on with this differential sensitivity due to the small effect of the Earth's magnetic field, the product yield of the signaling species would be different if the magnetic field is perpendicular or parallel to these rigidly attached molecules in the retina of the bird. And that way the bird can differentiate which direction the field's in and it knows how to go home. Experiments. So there are experiments are done with, by the very, very crude behavioral experiments. Um, they're crude because we have animal protection and we, it's very, not so easy to go and, uh, well, let me not go there. Uh, we don't. <laughs> so what has been done? What has been done is uh, you put a bird in a, uh, a basically a box. You have a, something like a big dog collar around the bird, and then you, when the bird is about to migrate, you can only do the experiments about twice a year. Uh, so the experiments are few and far between, and um, and you have to be done at certain times of day, in the mornings or uh, late morning, uh, sorry, early morning or late afternoon, and. The birds then want to start moving uh, and migrating, so they have this big collar around them and it's got wax paper on it, and then when birds want to migrate, they start picking at the ground. And so they start picking and they scratch out little marks on this wax paper, and this is the image you see of one of those. And experiments have been done where they've varied the conditions under which the birds are put with this, so the one simple one to do is to just vary the wavelengths of light, and so experiments have been done with green light, yellow light, red light. And they see that uh, with green light and blue light beyond here, everything is fine. The birds are oriented. Oriented is when you're in this region here, not the purple region. But when you get down to yellow light, red light, the birds become disoriented. So there's a wavelength sensitivity of this response of the birds. And then the other really interesting experiment was that they put a small radio frequency field on and they found that even in the presence of green light, then the birds became disoriented. And this radio frequency field is actually, turns out, if you look at the, the, the details of the theoretical model, is consistent with this um, mechanism for coherent uh, transfer, transfer between the singlet and triplet states. But as I say, these experiments are very hard to do. They've been done, I mean, each point here is one bird. So they're done on sort of sets of 20 birds. It takes two years. 
And then maybe there's, there's some criticism, actually, of this RF experiment right now. So it all has to be done again. Other alternatives are magnetic particles. So birds also have magnetic particles in their, bre in their beaks. So that's that. And now let me just end with close here. I think that's it. Oh, that was pro yeah, OK. So I'll finish here. And the last one is someone's going to ask me about vision. So I think the, the, the message that I want to give you is that quantum effects in biology uh, can be probed now to completely uh, different, uh, much more fundamental level than before with these new tools of, first of all, of ultrafast spectroscopy, um, and also all these new uh, quantum enhanced tools that are coming around. And there are all these other kinds of ways one can then use these things to probe living cells. This, for instance, is using silicon nanorods to actually deliver things into cells and so on. So there's really exciting times for interfacing uh, molecular probe, quantum probes with biology these days. Thank you. Um, people have talked about the faint young sun paradox. The sun was a little bit uh, cooler uh, a few billion years ago, and it occurred to me during your talk that that would shift the spectrum ever so slightly. And I wonder, when you're talking about quantum efficiency, if given the slight shift of the solar spectrum back then and the different atmospheric gases and ocean absorption, if people have looked into in situ or paleo quantum efficiencies when yes. these things were actually evolving. Yes, it's, it's, it's not so easy to do because most of the things that didn't, didn't, uh, weren't very efficient then just it. <laughs> but there is, OK, some of the oldest bacteria are the so-called halo bacteria. And they act, their main absorption is right in the middle of the um, optical regime. So they're purple. So actually, you might, reform, might reformulate your question is, why are plants green? OK, so for plants, there's this hole in the middle of the spectrum. And plants came on along later after the halo bacteria. And one of the, uh, the, the thinkings is that it was all due when oxygen entered the atmosphere, that then um, and plant, things had to move out of the, well, OK, let me not say something I don't know too much about, out of where they had to move to. But, but there is this, in the plant systems, there is a two-step, it's called a Z process a two-step process for, for the entire photosynthetic um, process. And it means that they, there, there are two places where light gets absorbed. And those two places are, take into account light from both ends of the spectrum. And they do have, there is this net loss of energy in the whole thing, about 1, e, one EV. And I mean, it's, it's very hard to, well, it's certainly very hard for me, to say more than that about the evolutionary significance of it. But my understanding it is, is that it's, it's not fully understood, but there are some thoughts about this. Um, and one thing I could say in the light harvesting is that one of the people uh, working on these coherences, Greg Scholes at um, Toronto, is setting up uh, experiments with an artificial evolutionary tree of bacteria, where he's making working with biologists to make small mutations to make sort of whole families and to see how effective they each of them are. Then just doing the spectroscopy on each of them to oh. see whether there are changes you know, as, you, as, you, as the bacteria becomes, in a theoretical sense, evolutionary more advanced. In considering the work that you've done with the eye, with the birds, does that coincide and uh, or not, or does it conflict with climate change and or the night sky changing? Have you heard of those um, theories or maybe truths? I don't know. I haven't heard anything about. Climate change. Um, I'm not even sure that temperature has been. Oh, temperature change. Mm, no. Um, I mean, because this is a coherent oscillation, it shouldn't actually be 
it's actually exactly the same reason we have this ratcheting and energy transfer. It should be relatively insensitive to temperature compared to a classical process. Uh, the night sky, of course, is very important, and most birds do not appear to travel well in the dark. So that was one of the first experiments that was done. I, so I meant their, they get their, um, their orientation as to what the season is by the, the sky, the stars, yeah, the position of planets. Most birds don't use the stars. Most birds migrate you know, when there is some amount of daylight. And so that was one of the, fir that was one of the experiments that isn't being disputed, that, that, that it's very important that they have light. They can't do this in the dark. They can't get going in the dark. There are other animals that, that use stars to, to, like some of this, um, maybe dolphins and the animals. Ah, I did have, nope, didn't have. Um, I, one of these slides I had a cockroach on the bottom because cockroaches are actually one of the other animals that are believed to have the same kind of magnetic reception. I think we have Let time for one more question. Yes. Uh, with uh, dung beetles, I've read that they navigate by the light of the Milky Way. Is that, is that a conceivably possible statement? <laughs> <laughs> I think I'll take the fist on that. <laughs> I'm out of my comfort zone. <laughs> okay, all right. Well, let's thank Brigitte again.